This series is dedicated to Brother Steve Copeland. Whether this is a valid dialogue. And the brother spent a lot of time talking about how much he knew. And didn't click on me till I saw the movie and he said them brothers came in from Newark. The brother was talking to Mass and I couldn't hear him. And he told me that at that mosque they did a lot of burglarizing, robbing. This brother had went to jail. They had done a lot of killing, burglarizing, robbing, and used the Nation of Islam as the cover for their criminal thing. As long as I have the clams, I don't give a damn about muddy water. Since the inception of America in 1776, the so-called American black man has attempted vigorously to establish himself in organizations with aspirations of social upward mobility. The Prince Hall Freemasons were chartered in 1784. Very soon afterwards, the Free Black African Methodist Episcopal Church was founded. Around the same time, the first mostly enslaved Baptist churches in the South were also being formed. While these congregations were slowly coming together, the act of coming together amongst the people was still considered subversive even until the 20th century. As these churches incorporated themselves in bondage territories, restrictions were placed and overseers or preachers were hired to fine-tune the message. In Savannah, the original ministers of the first African Baptist church were all born slaves. And this only changed with the Emancipation Proclamation. This aspect highlighted a clear psychological division between the two predominant sects of Christianity among black people in America. Although Richard Allen and Absalom Jones had both been born slaves, they had been free at the time of their ascension into the community, church, and Freemasonry. Furthermore, their congregation composed of free wealthy blacks, some from immigrant families who had been in the country for less than one generation. In contrast to the average southern minister who was preaching from the shackles of bondage, This dichotomy of the American experience would come to serve as a fracture in the relationships between Southern-born and Northern-born blacks unto this day. Where the African Methodist Episcopal Church was used as a tool to improve the conditions of so-called free blacks, the Southern Baptist Church was used to pacify congregations of mostly enslaved blacks, repressing feelings of retribution into the abyss of fear, and consequence. In the South, slave revolts were always a grave fear for colonists. They took measures above and beyond anything necessary to suppress such an idea. Their fears of black retribution were only flamed by the ongoing Haitian Revolution. The imagination of white colonists were overrun with nightmares of the black boogeyman. Regarding the initial tenets of Prince Hall Freemasonry pertaining to one being born free, Masonry wasn't a group in which the rank and file of black Southern Baptist preachers were commonly involved, unless it was brick Masonry, as was the case with Elijah Poole. 
The father of Elijah Poole, a.k.a. Elijah Muhammad, was a Southern Baptist preacher, only one generation removed from the years prior to emancipation. He worked as a sharecropper, as was common. Another commonality among Southerners at the time was the Great Migration, in which Southern blacks migrated to urban and industrialized centers in the Northeast, West, and Midwest. In the Northeast, cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. saw a significant boom. In the West, Los Angeles and the Bay Area. In the Midwest, Cleveland, Chicago, and Detroit all saw dramatic increases to their black population migrating from the South. Having experienced enough of the racial tension and violence in Georgia, a young Elijah, along with his wife, parents, and family, moved to a suburb of Detroit, Michigan. Where he would later come into contact with Wallace Ford Dodd. Bart took Elijah under his wing and taught him all about his new peculiar brand of Islam for around three years. According to Elijah Muhammad, Allah had come to flesh as W.D. Farr. What happened to Wallace Farr? Theories abound. Many say he simply went back to prison and assumed another identity as both he was quite familiar with. Nonetheless, Elijah was well poised to succeed Fard. He had been given a name, Elijah Kareem, then Muhammad, and also whatever following remained after Fard's disappearance. As was the case with Noble Drew Ali's Moorish Science Temple, Elijah Muhammad's position as messenger of the newly refurbished Nation of Islam faced opposition from within and without. Jedgar's Bureau of Investigation made several attempts to infiltrate both organizations with paid informants and dissenters. Contention between fellow Muslims and threats of violence within the community sparked over who would take over the reins, eventually leading Elijah to uproot from Detroit and restation in Chicago. However, threats against his life would continue to persist. Elijah was still able to travel to establish other temples in Milwaukee and D.C. over the next few years after Fard's vanishment. Over this period, a heavy pro-communist environment nearly impregnated more than just teenagers within the nation. During World War II, Elijah Muhammad's anti-war sentiment led to sedition charges for instructing his followers not to support the war or register for the draft. The media used these charges to paint the nation as commie sympathizers. Many people have poised the question, asking, was Elijah Muhammad a Freemason? In 1994, he published a book entitled The Secrets of Freemasonry, and he was rumored to be a member of the ancient Egyptian order of the Mystic Shrine, the same organization promoted by Hamid Suleiman and later appropriated by Noble Drew Ali. In his book, he elaborates on the historical significance of black men being unacceptable to white masons and further explain how the Quran is the only way to make a black man a true mason. Nonetheless, the Nation of Islam adopted its fair share of Masonic philosophy in a similar way to its predecessors, the Moorish Science Temple and even the UNIA. Earl and Louise Little 
were two Garveyite UNIA members who had a son that eventually became the Nation of Islam's most transcendent member. In September 1931, Earl Little was murdered and ran over by a streetcar at the hands of a white supremacist gang in Lansing, Michigan. His murder determined by the coroner to be a suicide and only later changed in the report. This event would have a profound effect on Louise Little and her entire family. Her late husband, born in Georgia, and similar to the father of Elijah Muhammad, Earl had also been a lay Baptist preacher in the state of Georgia and at some point moved to Michigan. A few years after the murder of Earl, Louise was institutionalized in a psychiatric hospital in Michigan and Malcolm was split away from his siblings and relinquished to various foster homes, virtually paving his path into a life of crime and subsequently the Nation of Islam. Following his tumultuous teenage years, Malcolm was arrested in 1946 and would spend the next several years in prison. During his years locked down, Malcolm was introduced to the Nation of Islam and over the next three years began corresponding with Elijah Muhammad himself. According to Manning Marable, while in prison, Malcolm wrote a letter to the president condemning the country's position in the Korean War and reportedly professed himself to be a communist. Malcolm Little was released on parole in 1952 and began an active membership within the nation. Over the first few years after his first communications with Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm dropped the surname Little and added an X to represent his unknown African surname and to drop the slave master's name. His first years within the nation were tremendously influential, and Malcolm's popularity exploded. His recruitment numbers produced the most significant rise in membership in the organization's history, to the point that he was under constant surveillance by the FBI. By all accounts, his gift as a speaker was seen as an attribute unmatched by any of his counterparts, and his steadfast rise into the spotlight would be perceived as a threat, not only by the government, law enforcement agencies, and the media, but also within his own brotherhood. The nation's message was beginning to get mainstream attention. In 1959, Mike Wallace produced a documentary about the Nation of Islam entitled The Hate That Hate Produced. So now... The hate that hate produced. While city officials, state agencies, white liberals, and sober-minded Negroes stand idly by, a group of Negro dissenters is taking to street corner stepladders, church pulpits, sports arenas, and ballroom platforms across the United States to preach a gospel of hate that would set off a federal investigation if it were preached by Southern whites. What are they saying? Listen. I charge the white man with being the greatest liar on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest drunkard on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest swine eater on earth. Yet the Bible forbids it. I charge the white man with being the greatest gambler on earth. I charge the white man, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, with being the greatest murderer on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest peace breaker on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest adulterer on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest robber on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest deceiver on earth. I charge the white man with being the greatest troublemaker on earth. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I ask you, bring back a verdict of guilty as charged. The indictment you've just heard is being delivered over and over again in most of the major cities across the country. This charge comes at the climax of a morality play called The Trial. The plot, indeed the message of the play, is that the white man has been put on trial for his sins against the black man. He has been found guilty. The sentence is death. The play is sponsored 
produced by a Negro religious group who call themselves the Muslims. They use a good deal of the paraphernalia of the traditional religion of Islam, but they are fervently disavowed by Orthodox Muslims. These homegrown Negro American Muslims are the most powerful of the black supremacist groups. They now claim a membership of at least a quarter of a million Negroes. Their doctrine is being taught in 50 cities across the nation. Let no one underestimate the Muslims. They have their own parochial schools, like this one in Chicago, where Muslim children are taught to hate the white man. Even the clothes they wear are in sharp contrast to American dress, like these two Negro children going to school. Wherever they go, the Muslims withdraw from the life of the community. They have their own stores, supermarkets, barbershops, restaurants. Here you see a progressive, modern, air-conditioned Muslim department store on Chicago's south side. Their story of hatred for the white man is carried in many Negro newspapers. Here you see their minister, Malcolm X, proudly displaying five of the biggest Negro papers in America. Papers published in Los Angeles, New York, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Newark. Negro politicians, regardless of their private beliefs, listen when the leaders of the black supremacist movement speak. Here, you see Manhattan Borough President Hewlin Jack shaking hands with Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Muslims. And here is City Councilman Earl Brown addressing a Muslim rally. Four or five times a year, the Muslims assemble in one of America's major cities to hear their leader, Elijah Muhammad. This coming Sunday afternoon, they will gather at New York's St. Nicholas Arena to hear him. But here, you see them arriving at Washington's Uline Arena for a meeting they held just six weeks ago. Every devout Muslim is eager to attend these meetings. For some time between now and 1970, and at just such a rally as this, the Muslim leader has intimated that he will give the call for the destruction of the white man. As you will see, every precaution is taken to protect their leader at these meetings. The Muslims, both men and women, submit themselves to a complete search before they finally enter the meeting hall. Some 10,000 persons attended the rally that you see here. All of them were searched. That's a search going on here. This process began three hours before the meeting started. And shortly, you will see Elijah Muhammad, founder and spiritual leader of the group. His flock is waiting for him now. And finally, here comes their spiritual leader, Elijah Muhammad. He's actually Elijah Poole of Hawkinsville, Georgia. During World War II, Muhammad was arrested and charged with sedition and draft dodging. The Department of Justice finally dropped the charge that he had advocated defeat of the white democracies and victory for the colored Japanese. But Muhammad and his followers did serve time in the federal penitentiary for refusing to register for the draft. Here you will hear Elijah Muhammad introduced by Minister Malcolm X, the Muslim's New York leader and ambassador at large for the movement. The good news that Minister X talks about here is the coming rise of the black man and the fall of the white man. Everyone who is here today realizes that we are now living in the fulfillment of prophecy. Right. We have come to hear and to see the greatest and the wisest and most fearless black man in America today. Right. Quote, While Garveyism continued to serve as a model of political and economic self-determination for the Nation of Islam, as well as other nationalist groups, examples of heterodox Islam seem to have arrived from three principal sources. The Ahmadiyya Muslim sect, the African-American Masonic offshoot known as the ancient Egyptian Arabic order of nobles of the mystic shrine of North and South America and the Moorish Science Temple of America. Exported to the U.S. by Indian missionary Mufti Muhammad Sadiq in 1920, 
Ahmadiyya Islam proved traditional in virtually every way, save for the declared prophethood of its founder, Ghulam Muhammad. The Ahmadiyya pill fell most heavily upon African-American urban dwellers and the imaginations of aspiring black religious leaders of all fringes were no doubt stoked by its heterodox claims for an Islamic prophethood succeeding that of Prophet Muhammad. The nation's uninterrupted employ of Maulana Muhammad Ali's English language translation of the Holy Quran as well as his numerous books and pamphlets devoted to Islam suggest an important Ahmadi influence, as well as Elijah Muhammad's employ of the pseudonym Golem Bogans in the early 1940s. The ancient Egyptian order of the nobles of the mystic shrine were founded by 33 degree Prince Hall Masons in June 1893 at the Columbia Exposition in Chicago. For their rituals and text, black shriners drew upon materials quietly extirpated from their white segregationist counterparts, whose own organization was known as the Ancient Arabic Order of the Nobles of the Mystic Shrine for North America. This original shrine was established as a Masonic social organization in New York in 1871, but in its irreverent legend lay claim to having been founded by Caliph Ali, cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. The order is yet one of the most highly favored among many of the secret societies which abound in oriental countries and gathers around its shrines a select few of the best educated and cultured classes. Their ostensible object is to increase the faith and fidelity of all true believers in Allah, whose name be exalted. Continuing, far from exuding spiritual solemnity, the Arabian-inspired temples of black and white shriners became playgrounds in a double sense as burning sandboxes of Freemasonry where mirth and merriment reigned in contrast to the relatively staid dignity of lodge ritual. And since the red Turkish fez has been adopted as uniform style of head covering for all nobles of the mystic shrine, as sites where one could play at being a Turk or Egyptian, that is to say, a Mohammedan. As Freemasons, moreover, Shriners were frequently versed in the metaphysical rigors of the Egyptian Eleusinian and pagan mysteries. Kabbalism, Gnosticism, Rosicrucianism, Theosophy, and Astrology. Herein, believers claim, pulsed the subterranean roots of an esoteric hidden knowledge undergirding all religious thoughts, Islam included. Over time, especially given the ignorance of traditional Islamic practices in the U.S., Islam and Freemasonry occasionally came to be identified as one. A practicing Freemason for seven years prior to his joining the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad once described the relation between Freemasonry and Islam in the following way. Before the coming of Allah, i.e. W.D. Fard, Islam was sold to the so-called Negroes in a secret order or society called the Masons. This order is made up of 33 degrees, and it is sold by degrees. If a member is eligible and able to pay for all the degrees, he may do so. But only those who take the 33rd degree are called Muslim Shriners. End quote. From the Black Scholar by Ernest Allen, who is quoted as saying, Elijah Muhammad was a practicing Mason for seven years before joining the Nation of Islam. Subsequently, Fard Muhammad. Following this speech, which lasted some two hours, Newsbeat reporter Louis Lomax interviewed Elijah Muhammad, the spiritual leader of the Muslims. Although you have said that the white race is doomed and that they are a race of devils, do you make any distinction? Are there any good white people? For example, suppose I were to ask you whom you think is the best white man. Is there any such thing? I'll let the Bible answer that. He says, no, not one is good. Now, if I have understood your teachings correctly, you teach that all of the members of Islam are God, and that one among you is supreme, and that that one is Allah. Now, have I understood you correctly? That's right. 
Now, you have on the other hand said that Allah has taught you that the devil is the white man, that yes. the white man is a doomed race. Yes. Am I correct there? Sir? Yes. Now you have said, sir, that between now and approximately 1970, there should come a reawakening a resurrection. of the American Negro That's right. and that the extended time for the white man uh, may well run out and that that will come and in terms of a war between God and the devil. This coming destruction of the white man. Will there be any bloodshed involved in this, or will it be a complete mental uh, According to the uh, teachings of the prophets of old and uh, of God Himself, there will be plenty of bloodshed. Plenty of. It. Have you ever been accused, sir, of preaching hate? Yes. Do you think you are preaching hate? No. What are you preaching, sir? Truth. And if the truth is uh, irritable or objectionable, as hate, then uh, I cannot help that. But of even more interest to New Yorkers is Malcolm X, the Muslim's New York minister. He is a remarkable man, a man who, by his own admission, was once a procurer and dope peddler. He served time for robbery in the Michigan and Massachusetts state penitentiaries. But now he's a changed man. He will not smoke or drink. He will not even eat in a restaurant that houses a tavern. He told Newsbeat that his life changed for him when the Muslim faith taught him no longer to be ashamed of being a black man. Reporter Lewis Lomax asked Minister Malcolm X to further explain the Muslim teachings of Elijah Muhammad. That in the same context that Mr. Elijah Muhammad teaches that <clears throat> Uh, his faith, that uh, the Islamic faith is for the black man, and that the black man is good. He also uses the Old Testament instance of the serpent and Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he uh, sets up the proposition there that this is the great battle between good and evil, and he uses the phrase devils. Yeah. And he uses it almost interchangeably and synonymous with the word snake. Now, now what does he mean there? Well... Number one, he teaches us that uh, that never was a real serpent. It was not a real serpent that went into the garden. What was it? But as you know, the Bible is written in symbols and parables, and this serpent or snake is a symbol that's used to hide the real identity of the one whom that actually was. Well, who was it? The white man. It by 1960, the Nation of Islam was not only getting international attention, but international support from various African countries, and even Fidel Castro of Cuba, which again only heightened pro-communist speculation. At the same time, the Department of Defense was planning a war with Cuba based upon false pretense. In fact, the U.S. government tried to overthrow several countries between 1950 and 1979, including but not limited to Syria, Iran, Guatemala, Congo, Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, Ghana, and of course, Cuba. But communism wasn't the establishment's main issue with the nation. It was their influential reach within the black urban community, and their fears were only fueled by the white devil race rhetoric. An issue white journalists took special exception with and often prodded black leaders exhaustively with race-baited questions looking for sensational headlines. Congressman, I want to return again to the Muslim of whom we spoke earlier. You say you know uh, Minister Malcolm X, yes. and you respect him as a very brilliant man. I think he's a very brilliant man. Uh, they teach, and he said it to this reporter, among other things, that <clears throat> the proper interpretation of the incident in the Garden of Eden is that Adam and Eve were black men and that the serpent was a white man who came in and, uh, to say the least, uh, brought on this quietude and that the white man is not a devil but the devil, a snake of the grafter type, and must be destroyed. Uh, how does this sound? I totally disassociate myself from any such belief, just as I totally disassociate myself from the belief of some of my fellow clergymen who preach that uh, there is no room in Christianity for a, a black man except as a servant and a slave. But, Congressman, 
in all 20th century seriousness, would it disturb you if the reverse took place, if a white group had such a school and they were teaching their children that Negroes were snakes and devils and should be destroyed? In all seriousness, sir, wouldn't that disturb you? Oh, it disturbs me uh, that uh, uh, he preaches uh, that kind of uh, doctrine of hate because I don't know of any religion uh, that has in it a principle of hatred. Uh, there are various degrees of love, but not any degrees of hate. The man called brilliant at the beginning of that colloquy by Adam Powell, the man who preached a Vesper service in Adam Powell's church, this man, Malcolm X, is, as we said, by his own admission, the former dope peddler and procurer, an ex-convict who served time in Michigan and Massachusetts prisons. He is now a changed man, he says, because Elijah Muhammad's personal brand of Islam taught him no longer to be ashamed to be a black man. So it becomes evident that responsible leaders of the Negro community are fully aware of the activities and the teachings of the black supremacists. The nation was on the hot seat, but their charismatic speaker seemed to be a media favorite. Although labeled a black supremacist who spewed race hate, the establishment relinquished the idea that Malcolm and the Nation of Islam commanded a significant audience within the black community, ultimately siphoning the influence of the NAACP. I've listened to the Elijah Muhammad movement and the black nationalist movement, and I have heard the NAACP, and I don't feel that the NAACP's views are the way out. I feel that it would be better if it were more national rather than integrated. Among the people, the Muslims were making new headway. But among those very same people, the NAACP had lost their way. And now for our discussion of the hate that hate produced with me and my colleague, Louis Lomax, are five distinguished New Yorkers. First of all, Dr. Anna Hedgeman. Dr. Hedgeman is a veteran of 30 years service as a civil rights spokesman. She served with distinction as an aide to Federal Security Administrator Oscar Ewing and to New York's Mayor Robert Wagner. Dr. Gardner Taylor is minister of the Concord Avenue Baptist Church of Brooklyn, and he is president of the Protestant Council of Greater New York and a member of the New York City Board of Education. Arnold Forster is a seasoned human relations expert, director of the Civil Rights Division of the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. Jackie Robinson, former Brooklyn Dodgers star, presently a businessman and a columnist for the New York Post, is one of the more articulate and militant Negro spokesmen in civil rights matters. And Roy Wilkins, as we all know, is executive secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Most of the far-reaching court decisions won by the Negro people were gained by the NAACP under Mr. Wilkins' direction. That's our panel. Quote, in late 1961, there were violent confrontations between the Nation of Islam members and police in South Central Los Angeles, and numerous Muslims were arrested. They were acquitted, but tensions had been raised. Just after midnight on April 27, 1962, two LAPD officers, unprovoked, shoved and beat several Muslims outside Temple Number 27. A large crowd of angry Muslims emerged from the mosque and the officers attempted to intimidate them. One officer was disarmed, his partner was shot in the elbow by a third officer. More than 70 backup officers arrived who then raided the mosque and randomly beat Nation of Islam members. Police officers shot seven Muslims including William X. Rogers who was hit in the back and paralyzed for life and Ronald Stokes a Korean War veteran who was shot from behind while raising his hands over his head to surrender, killing him. A number of Muslims were indicted after the event, but no charges were laid against the police. The coroner ruled that Stokes' killing was justified. To Malcolm X, the desecration of the mosque and the associated violence demanded action, and he used what Louis X later Louis Farrakhan called his gangster-like past to rally the more hardened of the Nation of Islam members to take violent revenge against the police.
end quote Taylor Branch Pillar of Fire America in the King Years 1963 through 65 what disturbs me is this for three months I've been working on a story I wanted to give you some ideas now of some things I saw while you gentlemen were probably well at home one of Minister Malcolm X's members was picked up 10 blocks from your church. The woman, her husband had been accused of rape, which he didn't commit, it came out. Dr. Taylor, within an hour and a half, after this woman was in the precinct in Brooklyn, by a method that has baffled the New York police, Malcolm X had 300 Muslims, some of them from as far away almost as New Rochelle, and threw a cauldron around that precinct and threw it and brought on a crisis. Now, last week, I think it was, a woman was misbehaving in a restaurant in Harlem. The Muslims had nothing to do with that. Some, the word got out that the police had her and that they had abused her. What happened? In a matter of an hour, 500 people are around a police station. But for Ray Robinson, the case is laid with a near riot. Now, you are the sober people, Mr. Wilkins and Mr. Foster. You are the established leadership in Concord Baptist Church. But I've been out rubbing shoulder with a guy. You know, you told me that most of the Harlem leaders, Mr. Wilkins, didn't stand on street corners. I've been out rubbing shoulders with the people who do stand on street corners. And these are the people who wind up around police stations presenting situations. Now, and the point I want to make, and pardon me for being prolix, but I feel rather deeply about this. If people who stand on street corners set off, God forbid, a riot or any confusion, we are just as dead as if it had been set off by Roy Wilkins of the NAACP. I don't see the point, you see. Well, the point that I'm trying to make is oh, that... wait a minute, let me tell you. 30 years ago, I was a reporter on a paper and did yeah, police I news. I did a police beat. I sat on Monday mornings with a police judge. I heard the Saturday night arrests. And what you're telling me is all police stuff. Now, let's, I'd like to get to what Mike really wants to talk about, and that is, is this dangerous and how can we stop it? Now, let's talk. Is the NAACP on trial here because it hasn't got four million members? No, and a lot of all right, well, let's talk about the All right, I, look, I, let's get to what we, what, what we came to talk about. Huh? By 1962, Malcolm and Elijah had begun to fall out for a myriad of reasons. Most people believe the initial contention between the two men was over a difference in philosophy. According to Branch and Mirabal, Malcolm had been rebuffed by Muhammad at least twice regarding the unjustified mosque invasion and murder of Muslims by dirty LAPD cops. Malcolm was implicitly ordered to stand down. Louis Farrakhan relayed that this was a critical moment in the brotherly affection the two men had for one another. From this point, they would become estranged, and Malcolm's normal responsibilities within the nation were restricted. Who was the white Catholic school. president, who himself was discriminated against for a long time and accused Protestants of practicing religious discrimination, I think that he is way out of line to uh, use his position now as the first Catholic president to open up his mouth against a religious group uh, here in this country that is headed by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. If he's not going to open up his mouth and outright condemn the Citizens Council by name and condemn the Ku Klux Klan by name and uh, condemn the white Masonic Order, which is all white, by name, and the white churches in the South by name, then Kennedy is wrong to point at the Muslims because we are black and because we don't want to mix with the people down there. And I should say that when we express our uh, desire not to mix with whites, he, uh, they call us a hate group, and Martin Luther King is running around here telling Negroes to love all kinds of white people, and they sick dogs on Martin Luther King, so it answers itself. The man who promised all the American so-called Negroes who vote what he was going to do for them when he got in office, and has yet to do the first thing that he promised, but has paid off the Negro leadership so that they are silent and say nothing about the promises that he originally made to get Negroes to vote for him.
After the assassination of John Kennedy, Malcolm was quoted saying, it was chickens coming home to roost, and chickens coming home to roost never made me sad, they've always made me glad. Consequently, he was officially gag ordered by Elijah Muhammad and was not allowed to speak for 90 days. Malcolm X, you were involved in a controversy some months ago with your leader. Is that over? Well, I've been, I've been silent for the past 90 days because of uh, some statements I made concerning the President of the United States, uh, which were distorted. They were distorted? And, yes. And, what did you say, and, Malcolm? Well, I said the same thing that everybody says, that uh, his assassination was the result of the climate of hate. But only, I, not... only, only I said the chickens came home to roost, and, which means the same thing. Uh, uh, climate of hate means that this is, this is the result of something. And when I said chickens coming home the roof, I mean, uh, chickens coming home the roof, I said the same thing. But did you, did, you did not say that you were glad the president was killed. No, that's what the press said. Uh -huh. What would I look like saying that I'm glad the president was killed? Malcolm, this was your first public statement in that 90-day period, is it not? First time I opened up my mouth in 90 days. That's why I'm talking so fast and so hot. <laughs> <laughs> you, feel, you feel, however, that, uh, that we're making progress in, in this country? No, and no, no, no. Now, I will never say that progress is being made if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow, that the blow made. And they haven't even begun to pull a knife out, much less try and pull, uh, heal the wound. You have, uh, you have they no won't even admit the knife is there. Following his 90-day gag order and suspension, Malcolm officially defected from the Nation of Islam. Throughout the remainder of 1964, an independent ex makes his pilgrimage to Mecca to observe the Hajj in May. During his pilgrimage, he noticed he was being followed closely by white intelligence agents, whom he would later recall were organized beyond the scope of what the Nation of Islam was capable. A couple of months after his trip to Mecca, Malcolm returns to Africa, where he is hosted by several African leaders as an honored guest. Later that year, he toured around Europe and spoke for audiences of diplomats and political elite. Now drawing on a less racially based approach to his message, support began to flow even from white devil audiences. But his dance with the devil only enraged NOI leaders and the most loyal followers of Elijah Muhammad labeled him a traitor to the nation. For the remainder of 1964 and 65, Malcolm received numerous death threats. And on at least one occasion, the nation of Islam ordered an assassination attempt which Malcolm avoided. That the same man was the father of all four of their children and had also been the father of the ch children brought forth by the two secretaries who preceded them. Mm -hmm. So this story was kept among these sisters until 1962. Two of them rebelled uh, against uh, the person who was responsible and began to tell the story all over the city of Chicago. It caused many of the Muslims in the Chicago mosque to leave and go back out in the street. They knew it. and. Uh, it, I knew nothing about it until 1963 when um, Mr. Muhammad's son, who had been in prison, uh, came out and he, was a, he had been a minister and he was very religious and spiritual. And when he began to hear these rumors around Chicago, he went to one of the sisters and the sister admitted to him that the rumor was true. And uh, it was he who first told me about it. And when he told me about it, I, took, I wrote to Mr. Muhammad and told him about it and he admitted that he had a knowledge of it and that uh, he'd given me a religious explanation that would fit into prophecy and all of that, so I was quiet. And it wasn't until October of uh, 1963 that it came up again. And when it came up again, I realized that the same person who had uh, made these other sisters pregnant was still busy doing the same thing. He hadn't stopped. Two of the sisters had two children by the same man. And one of, the two, one of those two sisters was pregnant still, getting ready to have a third child by the same man. 
So when it was known uh, among the Chicago officials that I had a knowledge of this, they become very fearful of me. They became very antagonistic toward me, and they, they, had, they had to do something to diminish the authority that I had for fear that if this became public knowledge, the followers would leave the Muslim movement and follow me. And it was at that time that they used the statement that I made against President Kennedy as a pretext to cut my authority, and uh, some other things happened that finally uh, produced the split or forced the split. And when I made the split, the only reason that I didn't make this public knowledge was I knew the implications and I, I felt that if the uh, Muslims who were in the uh, Nation of Islam knew it, that which enabled them to be so strongly religious and uh, exercise moral discipline would be shattered and it would cause all of them to go right back and start doing the things that they had been doing previously. Who is the father of all of these various children whom you have enumerated? Uh, the first one to tell me who the father was was Wallace Muhammad, and he told me that the father was Elijah Muhammad himself. One of the sisters, uh, he went to the home of one of the sisters, and when he walked in the door, she says, I want to let you see something. And she uh, showed him her child. She said, here's your brother, and your father is the one, your father is the father of this child. And then I questioned the sisters myself, because it, I was shook up. And they admitted to me that Elijah Muhammad was the father of their children. And I took it to him. And it was at that time he told me that he was Muhammad, the prophet, and that Muhammad had nine wives. He also told me that he was David. He was the modern David, and that he, that he was the modern Solomon, and that he, he was meant, it was meant for him to fulfill today all of the things that they did back there. And how many of these illegitimate children did he father with the sisters? Well, he made uh, six sisters pregnant. They all had children. Two of those six had two children. Uh, uh, one of those two is having a child right now. I am told that there is a seventh sister who is supposed to be in Mexico right now, and she's supposed to be having a child by him. For one thing, when you first separate from your wife, it's a physical separation, but it's not psychological. You still have feelings for her, and you protect her. Uh, but after the physical separation has taken place for a while, it becomes a psychological separation. It was the same way with me and the Muslim movement. When I first separated, it was a physical separation, but my feeling was still there. And it was only after my trip uh, into the Muslim world and, and my pilgrimage to Mecca that I really was able to uh, exercise the objective approach to it that enabled me to see that something had to be done to bring this to light. Otherwise, a whole lot of innocent people would be killed needlessly. Well, these revelations that you are now making about Elijah Muhammad, what effect should they have on his following? Well, I very much doubt that any of his followers who really uh, are aware of what he has done would continue to follow him. Uh, he may try and justify it by saying that he's a Muslim, a Muslim, and that a Muslim has a right to these wives. If this were the case, he, these sisters should not have been humiliated. These sisters have been looked upon for the past uh, five years, or six years, or seven years as uh, being guilty of having committed uh, fornication. They have been debased, they have been degraded. I have, heard he, I have heard him, himself, refer to them as having disgraced him. So if they were his wives, he should have given them a position of respect so that all of his followers would re respect them and that they would have, his, have the protection of his followers today. Well, do you feel that you then, perhaps, now should take over the leadership of the black Muslims? No, I have no desire to take over the leadership of the black Muslims, and I have never had that desire. But I do have this desire. I have a desire to see the Afro-American in this country get the human rights that are his due. I believe that the Islam religion is the best religion for our people because it creates unity and it gives one uh, uh, dignity and, and uh, racial confidence and all of these things that are necessary to make a complete human being. Are you not perhaps Afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh, yes. I probably am a dead man already. What but, do you mean? Uh, well, uh, when, you know, when you understand the makeup of the Muslim movement and the psychology of the Muslim movement, as long as uh, any, if I, I myself, in, by having confidence in the leader of the Muslim movement, if someone came to me and I had no knowledge whatsoever of what had taken place and they told me what I'm saying, I would kill them myself. The only thing that would prevent me from killing someone who made a statement like this, they would have to be able to let me know that it's true. Now, if anyone had come to me other than Mr. Muhammad's son, I never would have believed it, even enough to look into it. 
but I had been around him so closely I had seen indications of its of its uh, of the reality of it but my religious sincerity made me block it out of my mind have you received threats on your life oh yes uh, I first received threats on my life in December uh, rather no yes in December no not in December in January when I uh, when it first became known that I had uh, came back to come back to New York and told the captain of the fruit in New York who was my right-hand man formerly and also the secretary of the New York mosque and the minister in Boston when it became known that I had told them uh, then uh, an effort was made to shut me up one brother uh, encouraged to go out to my house and shut me up and uh, it, fortunately it was a brother who was well capable of doing so but it was a brother who was highly uh, intelligent. He was academically equipped to think for himself. And what he was told to do didn't add up. And fortunately, he was the one who put out a feeler to me to find out what was wrong. And I opened his eyes. And then he opened the eyes of the same crew whose job it is to do this kind of work. You mean he was going to kill you? Oh, yes. Uh, one of them was, uh, an attempt was made to get one of them to wire my car with an explosive. That one is with me right now. Well, well, fortunately, correct. while I was among the Muslims, I, I never uh, lived beyond my means, and I have learned how to live within means. And I still have the clothes that, I, uh, that was provided for me at that time. I'm in the house that was provided for me, although we're in a court battle. They're trying to get it back. And I have made this statement to them concerning the house that they could have it. If they would take me back, if they would permit me to come before the Muslim movement, the rank and file, and explain or defend myself against all of the charges that they've made against me, they could have the house. But uh, they are going contrary to their own laws by standing up in the mosque and indicting me, but never giving me a chance to defend myself. And they say that no one can judge me but Mr. Muhammad. In this case, Mr. Muhammad can't sit as judge because he's involved in the case. Elijah Muhammad says of the Muslims, we carry no arms and we do not seek to win victory with arms. We do nothing to others that we would not have done unto us. The uh, two brothers were sent after me with revolvers by Joseph, the captain of the fruit in New York. They were armed. When, uh, when a Muslim is attacked, and you'll find this to be the pattern, when the Muslims were attacked in uh, Monroe, uh, Louisiana, uh, Elijah Muhammad gave no signal to anybody across the nation to come to the defense of their brothers. When our brothers were attacked in Los Angeles, again, Elijah Muhammad gave no signal to anybody to come to the defense of those brothers. Never have the Muslims anywhere in the country gotten any kind of instruction from the national office or headquarters on how to defend themselves when they are attacked by outsiders. The only times the Muslims have ever been given any instructions to commit violence is when, is when that violence is directed against a fellow Muslim. His followers are violent against Negroes. Are you not, perhaps, afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh, yes. I probably am a dead man already. After a delay in the court proceedings relating to the Nation of Islam evicting Malcolm out of the house they provided for him, the house was set on fire on February 14, 1965. Less than a week later, Malcolm would be killed. Malcolm went out of the nation. We all were hurt, at least I can speak for myself. I loved him. Next to Elijah Muhammad, I didn't know anybody greater than Malcolm X. It hurt me that he would go out of the nation, but then the worst hurt was Malcolm going to Mike Wallace. Telling Mike Wallace, and listen to the words now, Elijah Muhammad fathered children from his teenage secretaries. So Malcolm raised it to a moral issue. Listen to me carefully. Putting himself in the righteous position, putting his teacher 
in an immoral position, but then he's going to the white man to tell the white man what his leader and teacher had done. He did it with Mike Wallace. You can't deny this, this is actual fact. He came here to Chicago and went to Cups in it. When has Cups in it been the black people? And he told Cup, Elijah Muhammad, I thought he was a man. Father these children and wouldn't, in other words, kept it a secret and whatnot. I found that, that he was less man than I thought. Oh. He dogged the messenger. The man that took him from a pimp, from a hustler, from a stick-up man, and sent him before the world. Now he's dogging his teacher. What do you think we felt? Elijah Muhammad wasn't just a leader. That's our spiritual guide and father, brother. You don't have to order me to kill you. If you attack my father, my orders come from my love. I want you to hear me good because every Muslim that loved Elijah Muhammad would have killed Malcolm if we had gotten a chance. No, I don't need no damn applause. I want you to think now. We didn't incite that. Malcolm incited that in us. He would have been dead. He would never have lasted a year. Elijah Muhammad told us, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Told me to my face, leave him alone. And I'm an obedient servant. Elijah Muhammad or not, that if you attack him, I will kill you. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I'm not a killer, but neither are you. But if somebody attack what you love, each one of you in here would become a killer instantaneously. Am I lying? Mother, let somebody look like they're attacking your child. Here's a woman who fought a bear because the bear snatched her baby. And she ran the bear down screaming until the bear dropped her baby. Love casts out fear. We don't give a damn about no white man law when you attack what we love. And frankly, it ain't none of your business. What have you got to say about it? Did you teach Malcolm? Did you make Malcolm? Did you clean up Malcolm? Did you put Malcolm out before the world? Was Malcolm your traitor or was he ours? And if we dealt with him like a nation deals with a traitor, what the hell business is it of yours? Just shut your mouth and stay out of it. Because in the future, we're going to become a nation. And the nation got to be able to deal with traitors and cutthroats and turncoats. The white man does deals with his. In the years immediately following the murder of Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam, or more specifically Elijah Muhammad, was the number one suspect. I already said I said God uh, of well, Allah is the best lover of that. Mr. Muhammad, uh, Malcolm has said on several occasions uh, when, when he was still a very vital member of the Brotherhood of Islam uh, that 
that you frequently looked into the future and uh, received vision. Uh, did you uh, receive any vision as to the ultimate end that Malcolm would meet? Was there? Did you have any uh, any sort of uh, premonition that Malcolm would meet a violent end as he did? Well, I was in hope that Allah would chastise him and uh, bring him back on his knees. That's what I was in hope of. Were you hoping that he would come back to to your? Well, life? I knew that would be the ultimate if you live. There's no other way for him, or not any other hypocrite, or not any other hypocrite. But in the past year, more evidence has come to light. After a nearly two-year investigation, two of the three people convicted in the 1965 assassination of the world-famous civil rights icon, Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam have now been exonerated. I regret that this court cannot fully undo the serious miscarriages of justice. Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance telling a judge after revisiting the nearly 60-year-old case that the FBI and NYPD withheld evidence that may have cleared the two men decades ago. The FBI lied, the NYPD lied, and the DA's office admitted that it also made false statements. Aziz and Islam were sentenced to life in prison in 1966, along with Mujahid Abdul Halim. Halim confessed to shooting Malcolm X and told investigators Aziz and Islam were innocent, but both men were kept behind bars. They maintained their innocence until Islam was granted parole in 1987. He died in 2009. Aziz also spent 20 years in prison before being paroled in 1985. After today's reversal, questions still linger about the real killers. An attorney representing Malcolm X's daughter now says he wants a congressional review. In Washington, Faith Abube, ABC News. On the next episode of Boulet, we discuss the white face behind the black movement. On the next episode of Boulet.